Do you ever uh, find yourself wrestling with tech in your home lab? Maybe dreaming of, you know, enterprise-grade storage, but without that uh, enterprise-grade price tag. Perhaps you've even heard of GlusterFS. For years, it's been a real trusty sidekick for Proxmox users, delivering that high-availability storage HA right, meaning your data stays accessible even if a server node, well, goes down. It did this with a simplicity that almost felt like a, like a secret cheat code. But now, the tech world is buzzing, whispers of its demise. Proxmox VE 9.0 beta's release notes, they claim it's no longer maintained upstream, and yeah, they're dropping support. So is this really the end for GlusterFS? Is its long reign over? Or is there maybe more to the story, especially for those small Proxmox clusters? Okay, let's unpack this. We've dug through the sources you shared, trying to figure out why GlusterFS matters, what this whole fuss is really about, and uh, what its future might actually look like. Yeah, and what's fascinating here is how GlusterFS really carved out this very specific, very common niche. So for anyone unfamiliar, it's an open source distributed file system. Basically, it lets you pool storage across multiple machines, uh, multiple nodes, into one single cohesive volume. And it got super popular with Proxmox users running small setups, you know, I think three nodes tucked away in a garage server rack. Why? Well, because it's incredibly lightweight, pretty straightforward to set up, and crucially, it doesn't demand that kind of high-end hardware that, well, makes your wallet weep. It directly addresses that need, that really common need, for affordable, high-availability storage for, you know, budget-conscious tinkers. Right. And it sounds like that cost effectiveness isn't just like theoretical talk. We saw actual examples in the sources, didn't we? Tell us about that home labber, how they made it work. Absolutely. Yeah, one home labber we looked at shared their setup and they explained exactly why ClusterFS is their go-to. It powers their small Proxmox cluster using, get this, consumer-grade SSDs in these tiny desktop PCs. You know, precisely the kind of setup where proper enterprise drives are either just impractical or way too expensive. They specifically highlighted how GlusterFS lets them get something that feels like enterprise resilience, but without that enterprise price tag. That makes total sense. It's almost like turning your, you know, your collection of older PCs into kind of mini NAS, but with superpowers that shared highly available storage. For people tinkering on a budget, that must feel like striking gold, wouldn't you say? Oh, it really does. And this versatility it is NACs are scaling down from huge data centers to these humble home labs. That was actually what one user called its initial selling point. And we're not talking massive storage here usually. Often it's just like a few 200 gigabit bricks. That's the GlusterFS term for the individual storage units on each node. It's all about using the hardware you already have, the affordable stuff efficiently. Okay, so if GlusterFS is the uh, the scrappy underdog here, then Ceph is definitely the polished prize fighter in the storage ring, right? Ceph's fans, they're quick to argue it's the superior choice for Proxmox. You know, active development, robust features like CephFS, Ceph Object Gateway. Right. And that's exactly where the rubber meets the road for the small-scale users, the home labbers. Yeah. Because the core issue becomes pretty clear pretty fast. Ceph's performance on typical consumer SSDs is, well, to put it bluntly, it's often a slog. We saw one user who ran actual benchmarks, compared GlusterFS and CephFS right there on their Proxmox host. And their conclusion was stark. They said, CephFS is unusably slow, mm -hmm. just flat out. They noted that even using direct I.O., Ceph's constant syncing, that's where it forces every little change to be written to disk, immediately just dragged performance down to a crawl on those consumer drives. I mean, those drives just aren't built for that kind of relentless, tiny write activity. So it really boils down to how these systems play with the kind of hardware you'd actually find in a typical home lab. Yeah. Exactly. ClusterFS, I mean, it's not perfect, but it uses memory caching really effectively, smartly. It delivered speeds that, in some tests we saw, actually outpaced raw hard drives, which is pretty neat. It's kind of a clever design choice that makes it feel like a breakthrough when you're working with resource-constrained setups. Ceph, on the other hand, it really needs more RAM, more CPU power, and, yeah, that specialized enterprise-grade hardware to properly shine. Another user shared their Ceph story, and they got it working really well eventually. 10 gig network saturation, solid performance, dozens of VMs. But, and this is the key part, they readily admitted consumer drives were a complete disaster for them. They had to upgrade to enterprise hardware to get acceptable performance. So GlusterFS's ability to just work, even with uh, junk SSDs, as one user hilariously called their drives, that only got like 3 MBs right speeds, that's a lifeline for many home lappers. Junk SSDs. I love that. It really captures that whole DIY make it work spirit, doesn't it? It's not about having the perfect expensive gear. It's about making what you have actually do the job, which um, brings us to maybe the biggest cloud hanging over GlusterFS right now. 
Yeah. This whole perception around its maintenance status. Indeed. And the, the biggest threat to GlusterFS's future, it isn't really its performance in its niche. It's this perception that it's basically a dead project. Proxmox's decision, like we said, seems to stem from claims that GlusterFS isn't actively maintained anymore. And we've seen that echoed online. One commenter pointed out the commit rate, you know, the number of code changes, has dwindled significantly. Plus, Red Hat, a major contributor historically, pulled back their commercial support a while ago. Hmm. This really raises a critical point about open source, doesn't it? What does maintained truly mean in that world? Does a low commit rate automatically mean a project is, well, dead in the water? It's a really crucial distinction. You're right. And the community, or at least parts of it, pushes back hard on this idea that GlusterFS is truly dead. One user made a great point, countering, number of commits has no bearing on the state of a product. They compared it to classic Linux tools, things like grep or cat. These haven't needed big changes in years, but they're rock solid, totally indispensable. Others point out that maintenance still happens. It covers critical things like kernel compatibility, Debian compatibility. You know, ensuring GlusterFS doesn't just suddenly break when you update your system. So for home labbers, the question who will fix it if it breaks might pragmatically have the answer probably nobody. <laughs> But, and this is key, they're often okay with that trade-off. Unlike big companies, they can afford to tinker, maybe fork the project themselves, or just stick with an older version of Proxmox that still supports it. Like one user basically shrugged and said, it's Linux, you can still use it. <laughs> so yeah, Red Hat abandoned commercial support back in 2021, but the community does continue to patch bugs, keep it functional. It's definitely not the vibrant, rapidly evolving project it once was, sure. But abandoned in the open source sense. Probably not quite. It's far from it for many users. Okay, so given this whole debate, it's not really surprising that people are talking about alternatives online too. What other options are users looking at and how do they compare sort of in this context? Yeah, good question. Linster comes up quite a bit. Some users are definitely eyeing it as a potential replacement, maybe even something that could outshine GlusterFS. One person specifically recommended Linster running on top of LVM or ZFS. They praised its performance on those little Lenovo tiny clusters, said it was more reliable than GlusterFS and less hungry than Ceph. Mm. High praise, right? Uh, other suggestions pop up too, things like Starwin vSAN, or maybe using ZFS with their application for VM failover. But these often bring their own baggage, like potentially significant licensing costs of Starwind, or just a much steeper learning curve with ZFS replication setups. And ironically, even Linster, the one getting praise, was called overly complicated by another user. So, you know, it highlights that constant search for the perfect balance. Right, the perfect sweet spot. So if we try and connect this all back, despite these other options popping up, what really remains cluster FS's, like unique edge for the home lab crowd? I think it boils down to its unmatched simplicity. Mm -hmm. That's still the real differentiator, I'd say. Setting up a basic three-node cluster FS cluster on Proxmox, it's remarkably straightforward. Really minimal configuration needed to get that shared storage up and running. Now compare that to Ceph's notoriously steep learning curve or, as we mentioned, the potential costs or complexity of other solutions like Starwind or even Linster for some, GlusterFS just offers this incredible value, zero monetary cost, works on readily available hardware, and needs minimal kind of intellectual overhead to get going. Mm -hmm. For home labbers who just want their VMs to run smoothly, stay online, and not have to get a PhD in cluster management, well, that simplicity really is a jackpot. That simplicity factor is definitely powerful. But OK, let's be real. No solution is perfect. What are the main downsides or maybe risks someone should be aware of if they're thinking about using LustreFS today? That's a fair question. It's important to be realistic. Absolutely. That heavy memory caching we talked about, the thing that helps boost performance. Well, it does come with a theoretical risk of data loss if the power suddenly fails across all nodes before data is fully written from cache to disk. For an enterprise, yeah, that's often a non-starter, a big red flag. But for our home labbers, this is where that risk calculation kind of shifts, you see. With a simple, uninterruptible power supply, UPS, which many home labbers have anyway, that theoretical risk largely vanishes or becomes manageable. So it becomes this incredibly efficient trade-off. It uses the RAM you likely already have instead of forcing you to buy expensive storage controllers or those pricey enterprise SSDs that Ceph really prefers for handling synchronous writes. It's kind of a classic open source workaround, really, optimizing for the resources you actually have available. Gotcha. So it's about understanding the context, the specific environment, and then using pretty standard tools like a UPS to mitigate potential issues. Right. Precisely, yeah. We even saw one home labber admit their GlusterFS setup does struggle sometimes. Slow I.O. during heavy VM updates, things like that. 
but they immediately emphasize, look, the system itself isn't really the bottleneck here. It's my cheap SSDs. They knew the limitation was their hardware choice. Right. And that's also worth remembering. Cluster FS was originally designed more for NAS-like use cases, you know, huh? storing files, not necessarily the super intense, small, random I.O. transactional workloads you sometimes get with lots of VMs on Proxmox. But again, it's adaptability. It's ability to function pretty well in these small setups keeps it surprisingly relevant, even maybe a bit beyond its original design scope. Okay. So where does this whole conversation leave us with GlusterFS's future? The community vibe seems to be, what, tempered by realism? Absolutely. That's a good way to put it. You hear both sides. Some users might joke, oh, it's already dead. But others view Proxmox's decision simply as a pragmatic business move. A way for Proxmox, the company, to focus on their business users, maybe push them towards Ceph or other supported, uh, perhaps enterprise-grade solutions. But for home labs, where tinkering and experimenting is half the fun, GlusterFS's open source roots mean it's never truly gone. You always have that freedom. Fork it, maintain it yourself if you have the skills, or just you know run an older Proxmox version indefinitely if GlusterFS works for you there. It's a level of freedom that honestly feels kind of exhilarating in a world that seems increasingly pushed towards subscriptions and lockdown software. And it really reinforces that idea in the open source world. Success isn't always measured by flashy updates every week. Sometimes it's about providing tools that genuinely empower you to build something that works for your specific needs reliably. Right. So wrapping this up, what's the final verdict on BlusterFS then? It's clearly not a silver bullet for every single storage problem out there, but it really does seem like a potent a uh, secret weapon, maybe, for those small Proxmox clusters chasing affordable, high availability storage. Its performance, surprisingly decent on consumer hardware, its real ease of use, and that persistent, if quieter, community support at all, makes it kind of a triumph for home labbers, especially those who just can't justify Ceph's hefty demands or the costs of true enterprise solutions. So while Proxmox dropping official support, yeah, it signals a shift in their priorities, probably commercial ones. The open source spirit means GlusterFS isn't just going to vanish overnight. It's a powerful reminder, isn't it, that in the DIY tech world, success isn't always about chasing the absolute cutting edge. Sometimes it's just about reliable tools that get the job done. As that one user put it so simply, GlusterFS is fine. And you know, in the home lab game, maybe fine is actually pretty high praise and a solid reason to keep this underdog in the fight. Yeah, and this whole discussion raises, I think, an important question for you, the listeners, sort of chew on after this deep dive. In an age where technology feels like it's increasingly pushed towards subscription models, towards proprietary locked-in solutions, what does the enduring spirit of these open source projects like ClusterFS really tell us? What does it say about the true value of user empowerment, about the freedom to just tinker, to make mm -hmm. things work your own way? Maybe think about that balance, you know, the balance between chasing the absolute latest features versus relying on robust, accessible tools to just keep getting the job done reliably year after year. It's an interesting thought. 